everyone, I'm Linda Nickel. Um, welcome. Um, let's see, tonight we've got a couple of things that I want to kind of make a lot of few announcements. So um, you've probably been doing Zoom for a while, but if you haven't, at the very bottom of your screen is a chat icon. So if you have any questions that you would like for Michael to answer, put those in the chat and I'll get those to him as, as they come up or maybe at the end, I'm not real sure. We'll, we'll figure out how this works. Um, for a lot of you, if this is your first time, welcome. Um, the people here are some of my Instagram friends, some people that I've met um, at conferences and other people <coughs> have. So a couple of people have sent messages asking, what's the cost of admission? There is no admission, this is free. We're just here to share what we know, make some new connections with people that are also under house arrest. And uh, one of the things I will ask you is if you know someone that is interested in photography, most of these are photography based, but um, if you have some friends that are kind of getting into photography or would be interested in this content, please point them this way. Um, we're, we're usually a friendly bunch. Uh, a few of us are a little, you know, spiky, but, we'll, we'll, but we welcome you. So um, I usually go through a list of what presentations are coming up. Um, I'm going to post those. I'm going to save the time so that, you know, Michael can jump into the meat of his presentation. But I'm going to put, post all of those upcoming presentations on my Instagram page. And I'm Cousin Linda, C-O-Z-N Linda. Uh, I'm going to post those usually on Tuesday. That'll give you the list of um, the ones that are in, in queue. So take a look, look at those. If any of those strike your fancy, I hope that we will see you back here. Um, Aaron is kind of my moderator. By that, I mean she's in charge of the buttons. So um, we try to keep it clean but not too clean. And um, so if you're, wear, if you're not wearing pants, don't stand up. We don't want to see that. But um, welcome. So next week, which is May 27th, I believe, we're going to pop her up. Jama Pantel is a local Austin photographer. She does mostly portraits, uh, family events. And Jama uh, is going to do a presentation on the perfect selfie and that's not like your hot Instagram selfie it can be but it's more of a way to do posing that would you know look great if you get if you're in a position where you've got to do your own selfie mm -hmm. so Jane is going to come up with some uh, a presentation that will help us do that tonight's presentation is by a guy um, that I met a year ago uh, Michael Run is a Fort Worth based photographer. And by the way, this beautiful image was taken by his personal photographer. We were in Arkansas and uh, he was shooting this waterfall that was just an amazing spot that we found. And so Michael does um, a lot of Lightroom and a lot of editing. And if you follow him, on Instagram or go to his, his website, you're gonna see that he doesn't post a lot, which is something I would like for him to do more of, but that's because his content is, he spends a lot of time getting it right. And so tonight he's gonna to share some of his tips and tricks. And if you, if you saw the description, he's gonna go through a lot of stuff. So with that, clip to the next thing. So Michael Starr has a, um, a YouTube channel already. But tonight, right after, probably about the same time that we finished this recording, his first Lightroom tutorial is going to go live. Not live. It's going to go, I guess it's live, yeah, on live. YouTube. So he's going to, you're going to remind me to tell them about this, Michael, at the end. But I just wanted to point out, so the content that he provides tonight, if you love it, go subscribe to his YouTube channel because he's going to do more of these. And um, he also does one-on-one uh, -on -one tutorials. So if that's something that you are struggling with or would like to, you know, up your editing game, reach out to him. You can reach him on his Instagram at Michael Rung Photography. I think that's right. Yep. And, um, Otherwise, if you can't, if you forget, just reach out to me and I tag him in, in my post. So 
uh, reach out to me and I'll, I'll put you in contact with them. So with that, Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you. And, and thank you for, thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So for the group, hello, everybody. This is uh, the first time I've had an opportunity for this. So I'm quite excited. Oh, hang, me, on. Uh, hang on one second, Michael. There you yeah. go. Um, in case you guys are seeing, um, if, if you're in the gallery view, you may want to put it to speaker view so that you can see his screen. So it may have Actually, uh, how do I, how do I change my view? Cause it's covering my screen. Okay. Hit oh, there we go. There you go. All right, let's try that again. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to show you what I'm, or I'm not going to be able to see what I'm trying to show you. There we go. Okay. So, as Linda said, I am Michael Rung. I'm a part time professional landscape. Oops, did we lose you? Blurb here. I'm not going to read. Oh, hello. Yep, there you go. Okay, uh, I'm not going to read through all the words there. Feel free to pause the recording if you watch it. But the real, the main points here is I've always kind of enjoyed photography, but it wasn't until 2015 I had the opportunity to go over to Ireland for a business trip, and I was there for a couple of weeks, so I had a weekend to myself and went out and explored Northern Ireland and some other areas, and just absolutely fell in love with the scenery. But all I had with me was my phone. Uh, so came back from that trip and within about a week I had my first DS DSLR in hand and uh, just really found my passion for what started out as a hobby and just something I enjoyed sharing with family and friends to just absolutely something I love uh, that gives me a lot of uh, peace and calm as well as the opportunity to continually learn and uh, just express myself in a way I've never been able to and, and just absolutely love it and it's brought me closer to nature. I love the mindfulness of being out in nature, especially far away from people. Uh, and uh, it's just kind of my happy place and, and where I go to clear the head and, and just focus on nothing but the scenery around me and the sounds and the smells and all that fun stuff. The other piece of what I'm trying to do here is in my professional career, uh, I've always gotten the most satisfaction out of helping other people, helping them grow, helping them develop, uh, learn new skills, whatever the case may be. So I'm, I'm trying to do that same thing through my photography through, as Linda mentioned, I offer the one-on-one -on -one private workshops online uh, for Lightroom. I offer uh, in-field workshops as well. So I'm, I, I want to give back. I've learned so much through photography, through other people. I want to return that favor and, and you know, pay it forward for lack of a better way to put it. And uh, the last thing I'll say again is just thank you, Linda and Aaron, for this opportunity. I've been extremely excited. I was laying in bed until about 2 a.m. last night. Uh, not in nerves so much as just sheer excitement over doing this. So thank you again. And my PowerPoint just froze. First technical glitch of the program. That's all right. There we go. I do you want to put this out here real quickly? So I mentioned that I offer in-field workshops. One of the things I'm very passionate about is nature and taking care of the natural world around us. I'm a proud member of Nature First uh, organization. Uh, and again, if you go to their website, they lay out the seven principles of nature first photography, but it basically it's, it's founded on the leave no trace principles, if you're familiar with that. So when you're out there, don't go trampling wildflowers, try to stay on trails unless it's you know, clearly indicated that you're allowed to go off of them. Uh, be mindful of, of what you're doing and the example you're setting and leave it better ultimately. So just wanted to share that real quickly because that is very important to me. And then just walk through quickly some examples of some of my work. Uh, you know, Yosemite is uh, very near and dear in my heart because I had the opportunity to go there finally back in February with the Out of Chicago conference. And, uh, you know, ironically, it wasn't too long after getting back from that that the whole world turned upside down. So I go back through some of my Yosemite photos here and it brings me a lot of uh, peace and, and happiness and able to reflect back on some, some just phenomenal moments in that conference as well as out shooting by myself. And whether it's small intimate scenes or tight shots like this, on a quiet morning or one of your iconic views from Glacier National Park or unlocking the, the wonders and the mysteries of the night sky. I just absolutely love everything that photography has given me. And again, I want to be able to share that with, with other people out there and, and help everybody realize their talent and their skills and give them the tools that they need to, to get the same enjoyment and peace and calm out of it that I do. 
So what we'll cover today is, uh, I believe Linda already referenced, I've got the YouTube video going live basically right as we wrap up with this, but I'll do a quick walkthrough of some things you can do to customize your work, uh, your, your work day. I'm slipping into my, uh, my other job for a moment. Customize your, uh, your Lightroom workspace to really optimize it for how you need to use it, how you wanna use it, reduce some of the clutter, make it a little bit more efficient to navigate around. Look at color selection and matching colors within uh, an image. Uh, it's a, a couple little tricks there that it doesn't seem like a whole lot of people know, especially when they're first starting out. The magic of the Alt key on Windows or the Option key on Mac and what that can do in terms of helping you control some of the edits and the adjustments you're making. And the last piece is also, I think, fairly little, uh, little known, although I think it's starting to get out there a little bit more. And I put opacity in quotes because it's not really opacity, but when we get to that section, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, in terms of um, simplifying some things you can do with complex local adjustments. So let me stop sharing here and, or not sharing, but let me close out of my PowerPoint and we will jump over to Lightroom. Okay, so starting out here, let me actually expand these. Um, you know, for the most part, this probably looks pretty similar to what you're familiar with in terms of the standard Lightroom workspace. And I am just gonna focus on the develop module for the sake of time here. The video that I've got coming out does cover library and develop module. There's a couple little minor differences, all the general concepts are the same. You know, none of this is uh, gonna be too jarring to anybody looking at this with your navigator layout, your collections and kind of uh, file management over on the left, your history, and then your actual development tools on the right-hand side. Where you get into some of the little tweaks you can do though. So for me, when I'm in my develop module, I really want to be focused on the image I'm working on. I want to have as much real estate as possible for the image I'm working on. So a couple things you can do right off the bat is you'll see these little triangles on the far left edge of the screen, far, far right edge of the screen. Whoops, I just covered my screen with the zoom. So up at the top and then up at the bottom. So all those do is it allows you to collapse down those panels, and it doesn't mean you can't get to them, but if you just come over and simply hover, it'll pop out. That way you've got a little bit more real estate for your image that you're working on, as well as, like I said, for me, it's just removing distractions. I wanna be focused on the scene I'm working on, the colors, the light and the tone and all that. Uh, if you wanna bring it back out, you can, again, just hover on it or you just click on that arrow again and it'll pop it back out permanently. So that's just Umbro Numo one, as far as tips. Um, I think I totally said that wrong. That's why I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so coming over here, one of the things I, again, prefer to do is I just collapse down my navigator. I really don't use that view. So again, it's eliminating a little bit of distraction for me. I don't use presets, uh, but I do use these other sections here. So first tip you can do here is if you right click on any of these headers, except for navigator. So if you right click on your presets, snapshots, et cetera, you'll see that each of these sections is listed with a little check mark next to it. So if I don't wanna see presets, all I have to do is uncheck that and immediately it's gonna drop out and I'm not gonna to have to bother seeing that. I don't have to scroll past it or anything like that. The other thing you can do is again, right click on any of those headers. And this is where I, I get the big win out of one of these uh, little optimization tricks is if you turn on solo mode, you'll notice that the sections I'm not actually active in right now instantly collapse down. So history and collections were expanded, they're now collapsed. So I just have my snapshots open. If I were to close all of those, now what the solo mode does is I jump from section to section. So now I'm in my collections, but as soon as I jump to something else, it's gonna close down my collections panel and now I'm just working again in the, in the, in the section I'm worried about right then and there in that moment. It's nice on the left-hand side, but where that really comes in handy is on the right-hand side. When you're trying to scroll through and find that specific section of, oh, you know, where's my, where's my detail panel or where's my HSL sliders and things like that. You know, obviously there's a lot more here and it's very easy to scroll to quickly and miss what you're looking for, so on and so forth. So same thing, you can just right click and turn on solo mode. And again, you can see right there, all these other panels instantly collapse down. If I were to collapse this one down, now I can jump to any of these and it automatically is just closing and opening the sections that I want. And that way I'm not having to do this constant scrolling up and down and hunt and hunt and hunt. When I first turned this on, I actually hated it. It took me, uh, you know, probably a couple days of working with it to kind of get my head wrapped around it. Uh, but now it's absolutely, I can't stand going back to 
to having everything expanded out just because the scrolling just absolutely drives me nuts. The other thing you can do in here is what you may have noticed if you're familiar with Lightroom Classic is that these sections are probably not in the same order that you're used to seeing them in. Uh, for instance, I believe um, you know, calibration, I think, is normally down at the bottom and some of these others are, are in different locations. So what I've done here is I've laid out my develop panel to basically match my workflow. So when I come into an image, I generally crop first. I might do some, some of the you know, obvious spot removals if I've got dust on my lens or a water droplet or whatever. And then I'll move in and enable my lens corrections. I'll do any transformation if I need to. Uh, calibration, I use a little bit on just about every image and so on and so forth. So the way you do that, again, just right click and you'll see customize develop panel. You go in here and now suddenly, just like the other side, you can turn these on and off, which I use all of them, so I'm not gonna turn any of them off, but for your purposes, if there is a panel, let's say you never split tone, just turn it off. You're not even gonna have to worry about seeing it or scrolling past it. But also if you click and hold on these little three bar icons on the left-hand side, you can click and reorder your panels again to meet your specific needs in terms of where you want those to go. So again, just some real quick tips there to help you optimize your workspace. When you do reorder, when you do this customize your develop panel, you do have to relaunch Lightroom. So I'm not gonna do that because otherwise, depending on the mood of Lightroom, we might be sitting here for five minutes sometimes. Uh, but again, ways you can just collapse things down, eliminate things completely, reorder things so that as you're working through your image, you can tailor this totally to your workflow and help you just be more efficient. And again, the less I can do in terms of worrying about the tools I'm using, the more I can worry about the image I'm working on. It just helps me keep me in the right headspace as I go through section by section. Uh, Linda, that's all I've got on that one. Do you want to pause now for questions? You want to just go through everything and then uh, just go on take through. Q a at the end? Yeah, just go on through. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to show real quickly was around uh, some color tools within Lightroom. And there's a couple different things here that I can give you some examples on in terms of how to use them. So one of the things I've done in this image from uh, Maroon Bell's area in Colorado is, uh, you know, we had this amazing yellow glow coming from the, the golden aspen leaves in the morning. And I wanted to kind of emphasize that glow a little bit in some of the peak highlights on the rapids here. And, you know, in my mind's eye, that's how it was, but it didn't really get picked up on the camera too well. So, you know, when you come in uh, to a local adjustment here and you wanted to add a little bit of color into some of these scenes, let me find the right local adjustment. I believe it's... Da, 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 da. Yeah, it's this one here. So I could come in and do a color adjustment and then pop open my little color pane here and try to find the color tone that you know best matches that glow that I wanna get from the other part of the water. It's, I'm assuming this is a legitimate thing in Lightroom. It's been in the versions as far as I, I know for, for at least a few years. What most people don't realize is you can take the eyedropper and obviously dra drag it around within this RGB panel here. But if you click in the panel and keep your finger down on the button and then drag out into the image, it's going to let you pick colors from within the image. So now if you watch the little box, I'm trying to point at my screen like you guys can see where I'm pointing, but if you watch in the RGB box as I move my cursor around on the screen or the eyedropper around, it's moving around as well. So now that I'm in this bluer tone of water, you can see I'm over on the blue side, but if I come over here to the, the glowing part from the aspen leaves, it moves me into those warmer tones. So it's a real good trick if you wanna get an exact color match that you want to add color into an image, even if it's just subtle like this, and you want to really get it just balanced with the rest of the tones. Again, just come into that panel, left click, keep your finger down on the button and drag into the image, and then you can select anything from the image. If I wanted to get more of the, you know, closer to the pure yellow of the, uh, of the aspen leaves, I could just drag up there, so on and so forth. And you can see as I'm doing this, the uh, the rapids are changing color as well. That's a pretty gnarly blue that we just had there a second ago. So anyways, that's trick number one. Frankly, I don't use that a whole lot, but I do use it, like I said, if I wanna just add in some subtle little additions to the color and I wanna make sure I get a good match, I do uh, use that from time to time. And then once you get your actual color selected, you can still adjust your saturation to a level that you feel would be appropriate as well. Uh, let's see here, on this one over here for Glacier, 
would be another example of where I might come in here and create a new local adjustment. Let's say I want to do uh, a color adjustment and I want to take a little bit of that pinkish purple from the sky or even the, the purple alpenglow on the mountain there. And I want to add some of that color, just a little bit, a hint of it into the water. And I'm going to overdo it a bit here uh, just because it's probably going to be a little hard to see on zoom if at all. So again, if I click and hold and drag out of that image, now I can get that selection of the exact match for the color range up there and you can see it also match the saturation. Now if I let go and I create this new adjustment, I can come in here and start painting. And again, right now in zoom, we're probably not going to see a whole lot. So let me come back over here and adjust the saturation real quickly. So I'm just going to go crazy for the sake of example. Hopefully you can see that now it's getting really too purpley, but you can see again, it's pulling in from that Alpenglow tonal range the exact color from those peaks. And I can just add that little bit of a hint of reflection of color in the water. And I do know that there was that little hint when I was there, but again, in this case, the camera really didn't pick it up as much as I would have liked. So I just wanna give that a little boost and represent what I remember the experience being when I was there on site. The other thing with uh, color adjustments here is also on this image. If I come into my HSL and color panel and pop that open, Let's say I wanted to tweak the luminosity or the saturation or even the hue of the clouds up here. I could come down here and say, okay, well, the clouds look obviously pinkish or purple. So, you know, is that magenta? Is that purple? Uh, what is that exactly? So as an example, if I were to drag my purples all the way to the left or all the way to the right, you can see I'm not actually getting all of the selection I would want to. Or even if I wanted to, for instance, tweak the blue in the sky a little bit, you know, now I'm dragging that blue down, but I've still got these overly bright clouds left in the sky now. So what you can actually do is on any panel where you see this kind of circular target tool, if you click on that and go out of the image, similar to the eyedropper tool, wherever you hover that crosshair on, it's going to be giving you the exact color mix of that area. So now if I were to click and hold and drag this down to lower the values in that panel, or drag it up, you can see it's a much more balanced adjustment. I'm not getting those sharp, uh, the sharp variance between the darker blue, but the clouds aren't adjusting or vice versa. So again, a good way to really get in there and get the exact range of colors, because me going in and trying to perfectly tweak the blue and perfectly tweak the purple to match the, that sky, it's doable, but it's not necessarily gonna be easy. It's gonna take me a little bit more time. So by using that little target tool on your HSL color panel here. It's a way to get that exact color that you want and make your adjustment that way. So those are some color quick trip, quick tips. Uh, the other area you can use it in, just an example, is uh, green is a really good example of where that target tool comes in. If I come into this green moss and let's say I want to uh, brighten that up just a bit. If I click the target tool and come over here, I'm really thinking this is green, but usually with green, what you've really got is more of an emphasis on yellow. And if I just started messing with the greens, I'm gonna wonder why is it not doing what I want? So now if I click and drag, and again, just drag down to lower your values. And if you watch the yellow and the green sliders on the right hand panel or in the color panel, you can see that it's adjusting both of them, um, you know, proportionately to the mixture of those colors in the area you've selected and really let you hone in and make that total adjustment. Again, as opposed to, okay, I got to tweak the yellows a little bit. No, I now need to tweak, tweak the greens a little bit. And a lot of times you get some weird banding or blotchiness, uh, kind of like what we saw in the sky on that last example. So again, this, this target tool, I use this all the time when I'm trying to tweak my colors on a global basis within an image. And it just simplifies and speeds things up. Jumping from there, I'm trying to keep an eye. Linda, let me know if we're running too fast or too slow here as well. You're doing good. Do you um, want to answer just a couple of questions before we get too far? Sure. I'll grab a quick drink too. <laughs> yeah, take a drink. Okay, so um, uh, do you, are you on a PC or are you on Mac? I am on Windows, but all of these tools I've shown you so far should work the exact same on a Mac. And then uh, do you have any tips on how to import and call the pics in the beginning? <laughs> do I ever? Yes. Um, I'd say let's maybe hold that to the end in case we do have time. It's, um, I could go on that uh, 
quite a bit. I tend to go on rants about backing up your files and all that stuff, but yes, I certainly do. And uh, we'll be happy to share. Okay. Let's see. I think there was a, a question and we may have, somebody might have already answered it. Angie wanted to know what tool did he select in the first example to get the eyedropper? Yeah, I can go back into that. Let me, um, I can, we can stay in here actually. So let's say I wanted to come in here and for whatever reason, let's just pretend I wanted to add a little bit of green from the moss into this water here. Um, so when you actually, that, that is what I skipped. So I, I'm doing that through a local adjustment. So your local adjustments are gonna be your gradient, your radial or your brush tools in the upper right panel here. So if I come in here and I select my brush tool and then you've already got a whole lot of different predefined options from uh, from Adobe and you can add your own custom ones and things like that. But let's just for the sake of simplicity, say I'm gonna do a color adjustment. So now I come in here and none of my sliders are gonna be different, but you can see the color that I had at last used within Lightroom is automatically shown down in this little color swatch, swatch, swatch down here. If I click on that, that's how I pop open the RGB panel. And then in here, you can click and drag around within the box to pick a color. So I could just say, okay, well, that oh, moss is green. And I'm gonna grab that. You but have to I, have the permission to do it. Is that a question for me or somebody in the background? Uh, no, no. Uh, Aaron, do you wanna meet her? Tanya? Okay. So anyways, I can click and drag around within the box here and pick different colors so I can eyeball it and say, okay, well, that's, that's green. So now I'm gonna come out here and I'm gonna start painting in. If uh, this would stop lagging on me, that'd be wonderful. And we're gonna start painting in some weird sickly green color into the water. But that's not really what I wanna do. And for some reason, my, there we go. Let me get that back. So let me just delete this real quickly and we'll walk through that again, just for the sake of example. So again, I'm doing a local adjustment. In this case, I'm doing a brush adjustment. I chose color from the little effect drop down menu. And you don't have to change it as long as your values are all zeroed out. You can just come down and, and uh, start playing with it. Click on the little color swatch to open that up. If I click and drag, I'm gonna select a color within the box. But if I keep holding down on my left mouse button and drag into the scene, now, if you watch the little box within the color box, as I move around in the image, it's jumping all over the place, depending on where I've got the eyedropper placed. So now I could say, okay, well, I really wanna pull in some of this green over here. And this is another example. This is really a heavily, uh, a green that's heavily towards the yellow end of the spectrum as opposed to green. Now, if I just let go, I've got that color selected. I can click into the image for my local adjustment and I can start painting that in. And again, it's gonna, going to look a little weird because it's not really necessarily what you want in the water, but for example's sake, hopefully on Zoom, you can see that subtly I'm starting to, to brush in that color. And I've got my flow on my brush, which if you don't know what that is, it's not critical, but I'm, I'm adjusting how much of the adjustment I'm putting on with each brush stroke essentially by having a relatively low flow. If I were to come say, let's, if I wanted to come in here and say, you know what, I really want more of that green, I would just come back over to the right hand, click on the color block again, and then I can play with the saturation slider down the right side of this pop out color block and say, all right, well, I really want to go nuts and really have some green, really nasty looking water and just play around with it until you get it to where you want. Hopefully that answers the question in terms of how I got there. I think so. All right. Do we have any other questions or you want to move on? Let's move on. I'm, I'm afraid we're going to run out of time before we yeah. Yeah. And the rest of them, actually, I can go through relatively quickly. So uh, the other option you've got here is the, the magic of the Alt or the Option key. So if you're on Windows, it's going to be the Alt button, ALT, on your keyboard or your Option key on, uh, on the Mac. But if I were to come in here just to the basic panel, think of the Alt or Option key as a tool to help you visualize either a selection or an adjustment you're trying to make. So just for sake of time and example, if I were to come down to say my white slider here on this particular image and I hold down the Alt or Option key and then I click and hold on the white slider, what this is gonna tell me is if I raise my white, that funky color kind of uh, representation of the image that's coming in is telling me those are areas where I'm clipping my colors because I've added too much white into the scene. 
Conversely, if I were to back that out and come down and do the same thing, so hold down alter option, click and hold on the slider for blacks and I start pulling the blacks down, same thing, that's telling me where am I starting to clip my blacks. And what clipping means is that you're losing data. You're, you're, you're not gonna see any detail in the image anymore in those areas. So it's gonna be a pure black or a pure white and uh, it's just not gonna look uh, all that great. And you can do this on a lot of the different sliders within, within the develop panel. So if I come in here to say split toning, if uh, any of you use that. So one of the things that a lot of people do, let's uh, say I wanna add a little bit of kind of orange warmth to my highlights, but as I slide this, I can't see what the effect is gonna really do to the image until I add in some saturation. So what a lot of people do is they just crank the saturation up to 100 and then, then move that the hue slider around and kind of find the color you want to you want to play with. What you can do instead is if you leave oops, if you leave that saturation at zero and you hold down Alter Option and then click and drag the hue, it automatically is going to show you what color you're at if you're at 100% saturation. So it's just little things like that that again, it's a quick shortcut to help you speed up your workflow and think less about the tools and more about what am I actually doing to that image. What? Uh, another. Uh, a, Great place to use it is on vignettes. So if I wanted to say adjust the, the feather of my vignette, yeah, that's hard that's to true. sometimes really I'm see all that clearly that because it's so subtle. Hey, Michael, but if I hold, yeah. let me interrupt you real quick. Sure. Hi, whoever's on the iPhone, could you please mute your speaker? That's one of the ones that we cannot mute on our end. And also I think Alice, Alice came in if you could mute as well, because I've been trying to mute you and cannot. So so sorry about that. I thought yeah. I was on mute. That's okay. Thank you. No worries. All right. So anyways, if I'm trying to adjust my, my, the feathering of my vignette, it's kind of hard to see what I'm really doing because it's so subtle. Uh, but if I hold down the alter option key and again, click and drag on that slider, now it's going to emphasize or, or really maximize what that vignette is. So I can see exactly what I'm doing and say, okay, well, that's where I want my feather. Let go of the mouse button, let go of the, uh, the alter option key and I'm good to go. The other place I use it heavily, and this will be the last one I show you for now for this, again, the sake of uh, time here, is on my detail panel. So when I'm sharpening, you, or when anybody is sharpening, you don't want to go in and add sharpening to the entire image, because if there's any noise or things you don't want sharpened, it's going to just apply it to everything across the board. So what you can actually come in here, you can use alter option on the different sliders, and it'll give you a kind of a grayscale um, representation of the image to show you what you're doing with each of these, but where the big benefit comes in is on the masking slider. So masking is gonna tell Lightroom, basically here's where I don't want the scene to be sharpened. So again, if I hold down alter option, click and hold on my mouse key on the masking slider, what this is representing for you is anything that's white is gonna get sharpened. So right now masking's at zero, so the entire image is gonna get equal sharpening, sharpening across the board. As I start to drag this to the right, any of the areas of the image that are going black are not going to get sharpened at all. So the further you go, the more it goes from white to black. So you just find that place where you want to be in terms of, you know, let's say you had an image of a sky or, uh, you know, something that had a soft gradient, but there's some noise in it that you, you wanted to do sharpening to other parts of the image, but not that sky. You can use your masking tool here in the detail panel and use the alter option key with the click and drag and hone in to where you get sharpening where you want it, but hopefully you're not picking up any sharpening and some of the noise where you don't want to emphasize that noise by over sharpening it. So that is some of the magical things you can do with the alter option key. There's more you can do. The key is just play around. Hold down alt, hold down option, start clicking and dragging on stuff and see what it might be doing for you. And then the last thing we'll get to here is what I call the opacity adjustment for local adjustments. Um, and we'll stay on this Arkansas one first. So one of the things I do often in some of my images like this is I'll add in, I don't know why it changed the setting on me. I'll add in a little bit of added glow in the background to kind of help draw your eye through a scene. So in this particular case, I have a radial adjustment here. So let me actually back up, I skipped that. So I just came over to, again, my local adjustments, gradient, radial, and brush. And in this case, I'm clicking on the gradient or the radial and I already have one here for a sun glow adjustment that I did. And if you look in this panel, this is a custom kind of preset that I've got for my adjustments. And I've actually got this saved as a sun glow preset. But 
as you look through this, I've got almost every single slider adjusted in some way, shape or form. If I wanted to come in here and I say, I'd like the effect that it's doing, but I want more of it or I want less of it, I'd have to come in here and start tweaking every single one of these sliders to make sure I kept the balance of the effect while adjusting the intensity one way or the other. And that's kind of where I say the opacity of it. But there's a couple tricks here. So if I come up here to the top right of that adjustment panel for the adjustment I've got selected and I collapse this down, now suddenly everything is collapsed down. Uh, oh, darn it. So bear with me just real quickly here. Lightroom acts funny when you create copies on some of these adjustments. So let me delete this. Talk amongst yourselves. Give me 10, 15 seconds here. Okay. You're going to see some sausage making here real quickly. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to say I want the sun glow there. That's not quite what, uh, what I want, but for the sake of time, we're just going to pretend that's exactly how I want it. Uh, so again, I've got all the sliders adjusted here, a lot of different adjustments, but I want to tweak the intensity. Let's say I want to make that a little bit brighter. I could come in here and just tweak exposure or highlights, but then it's not going to be remain that, or it's not going to keep that balance with everything else. If I click on this little right arrow here and collapse this down, now so you can see I'm still on that effect, but now I have an amount slider and it's starting out at 35. So the key here is remember what you're starting out because the first trick I'm going to show you is the downside to Lightroom. If you're familiar with Photoshop, you can work in layers and turn layers on and off. So you can see with what I did on that layer, if I turn that off, what did it look like before I did that? Let me turn it back on and see what I've done. Lightroom, you can't really do that. But if you collapse down your adjustment here and you simply grab that slider. So I'm starting at 35 and I'm going to drag it all the way to the left and take it down to one. Now, if you watch the image, basically my adjustment's now turned off. So it's kind of a hack. I'm not really turning it off, but I'm turning it down so low, it might as well be off. Now let's say, okay, well, that's great. Now I wanna jump back to where I was. I remembered that I started at 35. I'm gonna take it back up there and turn that back on. So this is where you can adjust the intensity, opacity, whatever you know, term you wanna use. So if I wanted to increase the intensity of this, I'm just gonna click and drag to the right. And as you watch the image, you'll see it become uh, much more intense. And again, this is certainly not what I would do, but great example. And if I want to draw that back down, I would just pull to the left. And then I got here by being on the local adjustment that I wanted to tweak. And there's this little, when, you're, when you've got the panel expanded, it's a down arrow. If you just click on that, it collapses everything. And you get that single overall slider to adjust the total uh, total adjustment. And the cool thing is, is another thing you can do, speaking of the, the alt or option key, is if I hold down alt on my Windows keyboard here and I hover over the pen in the image here. So if you watch, I'm holding down alt and now I've got a left and right arrow on here. So it's going to do the exact same thing as that collapse slider that I was just showing you is doing. So if you watch all of those adjustments in the panel on the right, you're going to see they're all moving in accordance to where they started in accordance or in, in balance with each other. So that you can see the sliders actually moving as you do this real time. And I apologize, Lightroom's really lagging on me probably because I'm in Zoom and, and all that fun stuff. But anyways, hopefully you get the gist of that. Um, it's just, again, a really simple way to avoid having to go in and make all these little minute adjustments to 10 or 15 different sliders when you're into a more complex local adjustment like that and just collapse it down and drag that back and forth to change everything while you keep the balance of the adjustment that you've got uh, without getting anything out of wonk or out of whack because you're only adjusting one or two sliders. And I think that is what I was planning on showing you there. Linda, we've got 20 minutes. I can show another example of this or we can go into q and Yes, please. I feel like you're captured. So I need this, these, just so you guys know, these are selfish sessions for Linda. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, this is a great opportunity for me to learn stuff. So keep talking, just go. <laughs> well, okay. Well, I was just going to, yeah, I was just going to show another example of that same thing here. So if I come over to this photo uh, from Ireland, so I had the opportunity uh, to go back to Ireland on a business trip last year and, uh, for some reason, I decided to extend my trip a little bit. So I had some time to myself, but same concept here. So I absolutely love this scene. I was trying to edit, edit it to have a little bit of a painterly effect. Uh, so it wasn't quite so such a sharp, just, you know, digital look to it. 
So I've again added a little bit of a glow up here with this radial adjustment up top. And you can see this one I've made very large because I want it to be very subtle and fade in through the, the image uh, throughout. So since uh, Linda is, is wanting to absorb as much as, as she can here, I can show you something else. So another thing I do a lot in Lightroom is when you're on your local adjustments, so again, graduated filter, radial filter, or one of your brush adjustments, if you scroll down with this right hand bar a little bit, I guess it depends on your screen. But anyways, for me, I got to scroll down here. As you come down, you're going to see a section down here called range masking. And range masking is one of the most powerful tools. If you're familiar again with, work, uh, with uh, Photoshop, it's uh, in many regards similar to luminosity masking or other types of masking you can do in Photoshop. A little bit of, of a more basic version, but same concept. So in here, so I've added the sun glow up here. So I've, I've lightened it, I've softened it a little bit, but I don't want this adjustment to be in the shadows so much because obviously there's not sunlight coming into those shadows. So I, I want those shadows to retain a little bit of their crispness, crispness, but also keep them darker. So the way I'm gonna do that is come down here to my range mask and I'm gonna select a luminance mask. And for the sake of this example, for now, just watch the image around this upper kind of third of the image as I turn this luminance mask on and off. So if I turn it off, you'll see, hopefully, again, you see with Zoom and streaming that if you watch the shadows, right now they're a little foggy, they're a little muddier than where they were. When I turn my luminance mask that I set up on, you'll see the shadows darken back down, they lose that haziness because again, they're not in sunlight, they shouldn't have that sun glow. So what you can do in here with the luminance mask is you're telling Lightroom, I want to include or exclude my, my darker areas or my lighter areas. And I'll try to do this quick, but while hopefully making sense. And again, we've got the recording, so uh, you can go back and watch this. But if I come in here, and this is where the Alt and Option key really comes in handy. If you come in here, hold Alt or Option, and then click and hold on the left-hand slider. So the left side is telling Lightroom, I don't want to include my darker areas of the image. So as I pull this left slider to the right, I'm excluding more and more of the dark areas to the image. So you can see again where those shadowy areas are, you can see them going more towards black and kind of a, a, a saying is white reveals black conceals. So in this case, I'm using black to conceal the adjustment or hide the adjustment or exclude the adjustment, whatever you want to call it. But I'm telling Lightroom, I don't want those areas to be impacted or I don't want them to be as impacted. I'm okay with a little bit impact, but not a lot. And I want to pull that adjustment out of the darker parts of my image. Same thing with the right hand slider, but instead it's for your highlights. So if I come over here and I click or hold Alt and Option, and then I click and drag on this right side slider, which is going to be for my highlights. Now I'm telling Lightroom, I love this adjustment, but I don't love it in my highlights. So don't put it in my, 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 uh, my brighter areas in the image. So now you can see all those areas that were bright, the leaves in the upper left corner those are going towards black and that, that uh, adjustment is gonna be excluded. So now if I pull this out, you can see again, hopefully that the shadows still have that kind of glowy misty look. And now my leaves have gotten much darker and a little less painterly. The flowers are a little bit more subdued because I've pulled that adjustment out of the brighter parts of the image. And it's only being put into say the, the darker half of the image. And if I dra drag that back to the right, now I've got it reset back to just quote unquote, out of the box on the adjustment. I don't want it in my shadows, so I'm gonna click and hold alter option, drag that shadow slider back to the right until I get it to a point where I'm happy with the amount that the shadows are excluded. And then the other thing you can do is adjust the smoothness. So if I hold down alter option and hold on that slider and start dragging it around as I go to the left, it's gonna pull that, that, uh, that range mask more and more into the specifically darker areas so it's a less refined mask, but sometimes that might be one, what you want. You're trying to do some masking around dark trees against a lighter uh, sky in the background or something like that. You might want a very exact mask and not have any overlap. So as you pull that smoothness slider back and forth, you can see as the, uh, the blacks and whites adjust as I'm holding down the alter option key. And I will warn you, the smoothest slider lags. It's not just me this time. And as that comes over, you can see the slider is trying to catch up. And now we're going to a very, very soft masking. So really almost take, I'm almost taking everything to gray, which is not what I want. But for the purpose of example's sake, 
uh, you can see how that really lets you fine tune that masking you've put in place. Uh, I'm not going to get into it for the sake of time here, but you can do the same thing with color and use your eyedropper to go out and pick a specific color. So let's say I wanted to say, uh, apply this effect, but I only wanted to do it to the yellowish greens of the foliage. I could come in and use that eyedropper and click and drag a selection and my range masking is then going to be based on that color selection instead of luminance. And you've got the same thing with, a, with the smoothness slider, so you can make it very tight on those specific colors with no bleed into other areas of the image, or you can make it very loose and, and overlap quite a bit. So you got an added bonus. I wasn't going to show that, but Linda wanted to, to cheat and get, get more out of this. That's right. <laughs> You're trapped <laughs> in a little bubble. You want to take a few questions? Sure. Okay. So um, Elise did ask, um, is that SunGlow a preset? It is for me because I created a custom sun, uh, not sunset preset. Um, so let me just show you real quickly. Um, we'll do it on this one just for the sake of visibility because it's a little cleaner image. Let's say I came in here and I want to do a brush stroke across the, the middle of the image and I just want to do something really funky. Another little quick tip, if you double click on the effect title up here, it automatically zeroes out all your sliders. So now and I'm just going to come in, I'm just going to do something crazy here. I'm going to jack this exposure way up. And let's say I'm also going to take my highlights up. I'll take my blacks way down. We're just going to go really crazy here. Just for the example. So now I want to come in here. I want to paint that across my image for some reason. So I'm going to come in. And I'm painting, painting, painting. And I say, I absolutely love that. I want to use that preset on multiple images, but I don't want to have a notepad with all those settings written down or somehow try to memorize them or whatever. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if I come up here to my effect menu and I just click on that, if you come down to the very bottom, you've got save current settings as a new preset. So you click on that, you name it whatever you want to name it hit create, and now that's always going to be in your effect dropdown. So I've created uh, a couple different ones for myself here. I've got the mid-tone contrast that I use with luminosity masking. I've got an Orton effect one that I use to add a little bit of a glow to the highlights and uh, on, uh, images where that makes sense. And then that sun glow one I added as well. So yeah, I've got that preset. You don't, but you can create it. Okay, so it's an assumption. Uh, someone asked if you were using RAW or JPEGs. Um, I answered it and said RAW, but... Yes, absolutely RAW. So you can edit a JPEG, but the way I equate it, and let's see if I can get this analogy right, because I'm, I'm infamous for screwing up my own analogies. I can go to a fantastic steakhouse and say, I want my steak seasoned this way. I want it medium rare. That's how I like it but you're letting somebody else do all the cooking, all the seasoning. They don't really know what maybe you're trying to describe or what you really want, what you really like. So you get a steak and it's put down in front of you. You're stuck with it, basically. Maybe you can add some salt, maybe you can add some pepper, but you're kind of stuck with what you get. That's the equivalent of shooting JPEG out of the camera. You're letting the camera manufacturer say, Michael has taken this photo and this is how we think it should look. And it might look beautiful. You might be fine with that. Nothing wrong with it. But if you want to use Lightroom, you really want to use raw because it's like a raw steak that I'm cooking. I come home, I've got the steak in front of me, I'm seasoning it exactly how I want, I'm prepping it how I want, maybe I'm going to do some sous vide, I will. And then I throw it on the grill and I, I cook it exactly to the, the, you know, the temperature I want, the char I want, all that stuff. Now when it's set down in front of me and I'm done with it, it's exactly how I wanted it. It's not how somebody else thought I wanted it or understood that I wanted it. So if you're going to do any type of editing, you really want to shoot it raw. And from, from a digital file standpoint, really what it means is not only are you able to make the tweaks and adjustments that you want, but you've got a heck of a lot more data you, you've got to work with. So the JPEG is a compressed file. Basically any of the data that it doesn't need, it's thrown away. Whereas with the raw, you're getting the whole thing. So if I've got shadows I want to recover, I've got a lot more data within the shadows to pull those shadows back. Same thing with highlights. If I want to recover some highlights, maybe I blew out a cloud a little bit, I want to pull that down. If I've shot in RAW, I'm much more likely to be able to recover that kind of stuff. Whereas JPEG, once it's done, it's kind of done. You can tweak it, but you're not going to have nearly the flexibility as you would if you just shot in RAW. Okay. Um, Marsh is wanting to know if you ever use your histogram at all. I do. Um, so 
what I was showing you today is kind of like these images are done and, and you know, I've cooked them, they're, they're not raw anymore. But um, when I'm starting out on an image and I first come into, especially the basic panel, or if I'm playing with my tone curve in terms of darks and lights, um, that's where I'm really looking at my, my histogram. So what I'm watching for, and sorry, the Zoom's got a little menu right in the mech, smack middle of my histogram, so it's throwing me off a little bit. But what I'm looking for is what's the width of my histogram. If everything's bunched up in the middle or one side or the other, it's probably a fairly flat kind of dull image. So one of the things you're looking to do through contrast and whether it's with the contrast slider or manipulating whites, blacks, highlights, shadows is spreading that histogram out. You're pulling contrast in the image and, and defining the detail a little bit more. But what you don't want to do, and again, I'll just do a really sloppy example here, is that I pull exposure down. As I start bumping against the left side of this image, I'm clipping more and more of my data. So if I hold down Alter Option and I click on that, what's Lightroom doing? Okay, well you can kind of see now I'm blowing out my highlights because I've pulled way to the right. So you want to watch for that. And if you watch my histogram actually on this example, so I'm on the exposure slider, but if you watch the histogram as I make the image brighter and brighter and brighter, that little triangle in the upper right corner of the histogram is telling me, hey dude, you're starting to clip, which means you're losing your details in your sky. So I don't want to be clipping because I like my clouds. I like to see that texture. Same thing if you're going to the left, you know, I've got a little bit of clipping already on the, the shadows, but where it's at is so minimal. If I actually click on this triangle, it would show me. So you can see where I'm clipping is in these little nooks and crannies of this rock. I don't care if that's pure black. Where I don't want pure black is, you know, this isn't a great example. I had really good dynamic range on this one. It was, I think, a three minute exposure or something. But let's say those mountains started showing clipping. Well, now I've just got a big black blob in the middle of my image, which is not what I'm gonna want at all. So yes, I do absolutely watch the histogram. The most important thing though is watch your histogram when you're taking the shot. Because if you screw it up there, you're, no matter whether you're shooting raw or not, you may not be able to recover it. Okay, so David Valdez is asking, when you take the original photo, do you shoot knowing what you wanna do in Lightroom? Uh, when I first started out, not nearly as much. It was much more, I mean, frankly, when I first started out, it was kind of, you know, spray and pray, just to hold down the shutter button and shoot as much as you can. And, then weed through your 3,500 shots and maybe you'll find 10 that you actually like. Now when I'm in the field composing, I'm already seeing in my mind's eye, I'm so familiar with this now. You know, like this is a great example of this image actually. This is actually a composite. So when I took this shot, I had the alpine glow on the mountains, but by the time I took the shot, the pink and the clouds had disappeared. So I knew immediately that I wanted to represent on my final image what I saw. What I saw was there was that alpine glow still on the mountains in the background, and I saw that pink. And it was really fleeting. It was probably for 30, 60 seconds. And I just I missed getting it all in one shot. So I had a shot of the clouds already, and then I got a shot of the alpine glow on the mountains. I blended those together in, in Photoshop. But I was thinking through all that in the field already. Um, you know, I, I can't say. I'm that in depth all the time, like this, this photo from Ireland. I don't know that I had in my mind's eye, oh, I'm gonna add a little bit of sun glow in the upper left corner, I'm gonna do this and that. But generally speaking, I've got a pretty good idea of how I'm wanting to build the image. And certainly if I'm doing a black and white versus color, you know, I might even switch my, my uh, camera into monochrome mode. It's still gonna be full color on the raw file, but when I'm in the field viewing it, I can see how it looks black and white. Maybe I can determine right then and there if I like it color or black and white more. So I am thinking about that certainly to, to a fairly good extent when I'm in the field. Okay, um, Ajidio wants to know, do you ever use the radial adjustment to create specific vignettes instead of what Lightroom does with the vignette tool? <laughs> yeah, so frankly, um, I, I do, but not necessarily from what in my mind has been a, a vignette, but really what I've been doing has been, has been that. But I, I think just as a quick example, what, uh, what they're asking is if I were to zoom way out on this image, and so I do have a little bit of a vignette and I'm very, very subtle with my vignettes. If you can tell there's a vignette on an image, that like, drives me nuts. So I'm gonna turn off this vignette panel for the time being. You can see as I turn that panel on and off, it's, it's very subtle, the vignette on there. But what I could do is let's say I wanted the vignette uh, really just more on the bottom, but I didn't necessarily want it on the top part of the image. And there are some, 
there's a slider in the vignette tool you can use to highlight to, to recover that a little bit. But what, what they're specifically talking about is using a radial tool and, um, oops, I'll just clear this out. And let's say we're just using our exposure to darken. And then what that does is it gives you the control to create the vignette exactly the shape you want, where you want it, you can drag it around. Because if you just use the one that's quote unquote out of the box, you're stuck with it. It's going to be dead center. You can only do so much. This allows you to, again, really come in and fine, fine tune it and tweak it. I can bring it out further to, you know, to really soften the impact on those edges. So I, it's not something I do a lot of. Um, it's actually something I just recently, I had a photo critique done at the Outer Chicago Live Conference. And as one of the kind of tips and tricks I picked up on is, oh, I can use the radials in that manner and get that little bit more flexibility. So again, one of the things I love about this stuff is I'm five, almost six years into this and almost on a weekly basis, I'm still learning something new. Great. So we are running out of time, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna shove in two more questions. Yeah. Uh, so how much of your workflow is in Lightroom and how much is in Photoshop? How much is in Lightroom and how much is in Photoshop? Well. Traditionally, to date, um, I would say probably at least 95% has been in Lightroom. Mm -hmm. To date, all I've really done is blends like that, that photo from Glacier uh, National Park I was talking about with the sky and the mountains, where I just, I didn't time it to get them together at the same time. That said, I am diving into Photoshop. Um, I'm very stubborn. I come from a long line of stubborn family members. Um, so that's very ingrained in me. And one of the things that, <laughs> I have focused on over the, the last several years is, gosh darn it, don't tell me Lightroom can't do A, B, and C. I'm gonna figure out how to do A, B, and C in Lightroom. The kind of Orton effect is that. Like there's not a whole lot out there on how to create an Orton effect in Lightroom. I figured out how to do an Orton effect and I sat there between Photoshop and Lightroom and compared the two and you know, they're basically identical. Um, but I am diving further into Photoshop. One of the things I do like about it is the fact that you do, work in layers and you can turn those individual layers on and off. You can name the layers. That's one of the things that drives me nuts in Lightroom is I've got all those adjustment pins and if it's been a little bit since I worked on an image, I've got to sit there and click on each one to remember, all right, that pin was my highlights of my water. That pin was the green and the leaves or whatever. So there's certainly things I like about Photoshop and don't get me wrong, Photoshop can do a heck of a lot more especially when you get into the, you know, the, the range masking in Lightroom is not nearly as robust as what you can do with luminosity masking in Photoshop. So I am learning it. Um, that's actually something I've been focused on the last couple of months. Um, for me personally, I'm not feeling like this huge pull that as I'm learning to say, oh my gosh, I've, I've got to do it this way from now on. But I think where I'll probably land is I'll be doing <clears throat> most of my basic adjustments in Lightroom and then maybe some of the finer things that just it's easier to do in Photoshop, I might hop over there and do it real quick. Okay, so time. one last question. Yep. If you can answer it in just like bullet points of one, two, and three. Um, Samia has asked, we're gonna go back to any tips on how to import and cull the pics in the beginning. <laughs> wow, okay. Um, so we've got uh, like 30 seconds. So, um, <laughs> the main thing for me is when I'm, when I'm importing and culling. So first of all, when I'm importing, I'm always importing to two locations. I have an external drive and I've got my internal drive on my laptop. So as an initial step of backing my files up, especially when I'm out in the field and I'm downloading after a shoot in the morning or whatever on my laptop, I come back and I import the images, get them off the SD card. So I'm minimizing my risk of having any data corruption there and losing, losing shots. And then you can select in the upper right of the import panel, an additional location to import to. So in one import, I'm moving those files onto my internal drive and my external drive at the same time. Um, once they're in Lightroom and I'm starting to go through, kind of the method I've developed over the last year especially is whether I get back from an outing or I get back from a trip and I sit down, first thing I do is I just go through all of my images. First, I'm gonna go through and just X out or reject using the flag option going to reject anything that's just a total dud, you know, camera shake, overexposed, underexposed, you know, whatever the case may be, there's just no way I'm ever going to do anything with it, so I'm going to reject it. Then I start going through, and it's kind of like an eye exam, shot one, shot two, shot two, shot three, shot three, shot one, and I'm looking at, you know, variations of a single scene, and I use the star rating to say, okay, well, I think I like this one and that one out of those five shots I took, so now I've taken that five down to two. Or if, maybe a better example is if I've got 100 and I've taken it down to 30. 
And then I take those 30 and I filter on those one star shots and I start comparing those. Okay, here's all my one stars. Do I like this one or that one better? I think I like that one. So it's gonna be a two star. Once I get all my two stars done and maybe I'm down to 15 shots, then I'm gonna do one more pass through and I'm gonna find my three star shots. And I'm gonna say, okay, once I find one that's a three star and maybe I'm down to five or six or 10 shots out of that original 100, those are the ones I'm gonna work on and see what I can do with. Excellent. Okay, so <laughs> you did really, really good. Um, so, you know, for me, those of you that don't know me, I, I know Michael and I, I like to poke fun at him and he oh. takes it really well. <laughs> But I'm gonna I'm gonna share something that was in the chat because I feel uh -oh. like you know, this is this is a good thing. So for Valerie Hoffman, who was a presenter a couple of weeks ago, who is a fantastic photographer herself, she says, "I've used Lightroom for more than ten years, and I've watched hundreds of hours of training, and I've never seen anyone go through some of the tools in the detail that Michael has just gone through. It's been fantastic. So oh, thank you. Thank you." Look, look, well, that nice. Great to hear. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> video too. So with that, I need to, um, I need to close it guys. I'm sorry. I'm a bad guy all the time. Um, so somebody asked, do you sell prints? Don't answer it because the answer is yes. He will sell you a print. Yep. Just contact him through at Michael Run. Is your stuff right there? Great. If you guys want to screen, you can. And, um, so with Michael's permission, I'm going to post this to the YouTube channel that I set up for all of our sessions. And I'm going to let's see if I can do that right here. I popped it into the chat line if you want to save that chat. Um, in fact, you might want to save that chat. Everyone in the chat line, there's these three little dots to the right. If you'll hit save chat, it'll give you everybody's Instagram account that signed in earlier and, and shared that. So, um, Michael, how do you feel? Would you come back? Yeah, absolutely. This was great. Really, like I said, this is, I love doing this stuff. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity. I do have it. I have to share it though, Linda, if you can give me like 30 more seconds. Of course. It, but, I had, has to be nice. Has to be nice. Oh no, it's 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 you'll you'll get a kick out of it. I know. I'm sure John is already thinking it. So I had to include this photo of me because it's my you know the infamous photo from our Arkansas trip last year where I'm standing in the water in my waterproof socks and then you know everybody's making fun of me with my rolled up pants. But my feet did not get wet or cold. <laughs> but if you look closely at this photo, you can kind of see that there's little scrape marks down that rock, and I'm pretty sure this was after. Uh, John and I both, it might have been before, but at some point, John Fisher, that's in the, the group here, uh, we both managed to end up on our rear ends trying to walk down that rock. So not only is it the great picture Linda snapped of me with my wonderful outfit, but uh, it's also where we both almost broke our tailbones. <laughs> so. And Linda, I had to throw that in just for you, Linda. I appreciate that. And I regret, I regret not having video. God. Oh, I don't. Because <laughs> they both went down in the exact same spot. And it was just one of those moments where you blink. <laughs> and it's like, did that just happen? Oh, is he okay? Yeah. And oh my gosh, I hope he didn't damage Laughter. His... And then. Yeah, and the then, camera was fine. Yeah. And then here comes the second one. Boom. Right. On his so, like 60 seconds later, John does the same thing. It was, it was beautiful. So The perils of landscape photography. That's right. You guys, thank you so much for joining us. Um, next week, Jama is going to be back, and she's going to um, present her um, – Episode, her session is going to be on perfecting the some poses and uh, perfecting that selfie that we all, you know, that we're all snapping whether we admit it or not. So, you guys, thank you so much. We will uh, hopefully see you back next week. And with that, thanks everybody. We're going to shut down. So, Aaron, do you want to turn that off?